The 2023 NBA Draft doesn't have as much buzz around it as the 2023 Draft, and that's mainly because there isn't a Victor Wembanyama or a Scoot Henderson level prospect that can be the centerpiece of a franchise, at least that's how it's being viewed going into the cycle. But I still really like this class. It has a ton of prospects with upside, I think it has guys that have star potential, I'm going to be doing my first mock draft in the cycle. Now, the order is based off the preseason tankathon order. This is not an order based around what I think in terms of team power ranking, so keep that in mind. And this mock draft is one you should take with a grain of salt because a lot of changes can happen between now and draft night. Brandon Miller entered the cycle as a fringe lottery prospect, and he ended the cycle as the second overall pick in 2023. But it is always fun to do these super early mock drafts and track the changes that go from the beginning to the end of the cycle. But quickly before we go any further, if you're new and like basketball, I would really appreciate if you would like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be notified whenever I release a video. I make videos about basketball all the time, and liking and subscribing are the two best ways can help me out in the YouTube algorithm. Let's try and get 100 likes on this video so YouTube will recommend it to others. This one took a really long time for me to make, so I'd really appreciate if you would do all those things. Anyways, let's get into this first mock draft of 2024. With the first pick, the Washington Wizards take Isaiah Collier, the physical playmaking point guard from USC. Collier is the best playmaker in this class in my opinion. He is high feel. He has good manipulation techniques, he's really accurate, has a good handle, he's unselfish, he makes those around him better. Now he's actually my number two ranked prospect in this class as of right now, but his grade is nearly identical as the top prospect in this class as of right now in my opinion. We'll talk about that guy in a moment. I know the Wizards have Tyus Jones and Jordan Poole, and I like those guys a lot. I think Tyus Jones is one of the most reliable point guards in the league who's finally getting a chance to be a starter and Poole is somebody I think still has legit all-star upside but Jordan Poole can play the two guard spot I think that's more of his natural position anyways and Tyus Jones is lineup and role versatile and could go back to being a sixth man or a depth piece and Collier brings rim pressure and playmaking that you look for in a star point guard He's not a great athlete, but he is a good one, and he makes up for maybe not being a Scoot Henderson or a Men Thompson level athlete with incredible physicality. Probably the strongest non-Scoot point guard I've evaluated in terms of pure strength, and he has good potential defensively. Now he needs to improve as a suitor, but he's far from a lost cause in that area. I wouldn't have him going this high in the draft as of right now if I didn't think that his ability to shoot the basketball is something that could be worked on. He's not quite as highly graded of a point guard prospect for me as some guys in the past like Scoot Henderson and Lamelo Ball, but he's still a great point guard prospect worth taking first overall in this class as of right now in my opinion, assuming he does have the year I think he will at USC. The Rockets seem to have a lot of players set long term at positions like point guard, shooting guard, power forward, and center. In Amen Thompson, Jalen Green, Jabari Smith Jr., and Alpin Sangoon. But while they paid Dylan Brooks a lot of money, I don't think that would stop them from taking Ron Holland, who is my number one ranked prospect in this class going into the cycle. He's one of the youngest prospects in this class. He's a freak athlete. He can fly around the floor, has great ground coverage, versatile on both ends of the floor. The best motor from a prospect I've seen since I started this in 2016. He's what Ime Yudoka covets in a player, and I think that will factor in a lot if the Rockets are in position to draft him if they do end up with a top three pick. He can play multiple defensive coverages. He has really intriguing playmaking upside. He has some untapped potential as a suitor and creator. Now those two areas are swing factors in him reaching his full potential. But I like what I saw from him in those two preseason games with the Ignite. If he's even 65 to 70% of 
what he was in those games this season with Ignite, he will be in lock for the top three and maybe even the top pack. In fact, I considered him for this first mock draft with that first pack. Assuming Damian Lillard is traded, the Blazers will be entering a new era around Scoot Henderson. Now this pick may surprise some of you, but Ademara is my number three ranked prospect in this class as of right now. And I think he's a really good fit with that core of young guys that the Blazers have. Nurkic is a good player, but he's not a long-term answer in my opinion. He just doesn't really fit the timeline that the Blazers are going to likely be on. And Mara brings playmaking and paint protecting at the five that is truly special. Now he's not quite the mover in terms of his movement skills that Victor Wembanyama, Evan Mobley, Jet Holmgren, or even Jalen Duran are. He's not that kind of big, but it's not like he's a step. He does move pretty well for somebody that size, even if he's not this big with wing-like movement skills. But at 7'3", 245 pounds, he's a high field playmaker, he's a high field paint protector, he's good on the block, has good post technique, he can hit a mid-range jumper, maybe even extend his range to the three-point line due time. And I think he just has the foundation that you look for in a modern bag that maybe isn't quite that freakish mover, but is super skilled and does have star potential in the NBA as a big man. I know Matas Brazelis is the number one guy for a lot of people, and I get it. I totally understand it. He's versatile. He has guard-like skills at nearly seven feet tall, and the upside is truly incredible with him. But I'm not quite that high on him in terms of this surefire top two, top three pack, the current hands down favorite to be number one in this class. I think he's a bit more raw than some believe he is, but I still love him as a prospect. He's one of the more fun prospects for me to watch in this class. He has upside as a creator, passer, and role versatile forward. And the Pistons need role versatile players because of how many guys they have on roster with legit upside. And I think it's clear that they target role versatile players given their recent draft history of guys that can play multiple roles and positions like Kay Cunningham, Jay Nivey, Jalen Duran, and Esau Thompson. Brazelis fits that mold as well. He can be a connector, he can be a scorer, he can play off the ball, he can play on the ball. He does need to bulk up, continue to improve his perimeter skill upside and defensive consistency, but he does have the potential to be a star and fits well with many teams and depending on the type of year he has with Ignite, he could be off the board well before it picked for it. The Hornets are objectively a mess. A lot of the young guys haven't panned out and they've been in the news for a few things this offseason. But LaMelo Ball is a legit star with legit All-NBA upside, and while I wouldn't have taken him second overall, Brandon Miller is a player that I am very confident in, at the very least, being a starter-level guy, and he does have all starter friends All-NBA upside. I know people are lower on DJ Wagner, but I think he's easily a top 5 prospect as of right now. He's a combo guard that can handle reps on and off the ball. He's an advanced shot creator. He's a high field player. He's a safety and quick slasher. Has a really good handle. And I think that's a skill set that would fit well with Lamelo. I love Terry Rozier. I love his time in Boston. I think he's been pretty good in the NBA. But he's not the long term answer next to Lamelo. And I think that getting one of the more gifted guards in this class that fits next to the franchise centerpiece would be ideal for the Hornets. The Spurs landed a guy that has potential to maybe be the best player in the world one day in Victor Wembanyama. And when you land that type of generational talent and have a chance to build around him, it's important to get pieces that fit around him and also have upside obviously and Stefan Castle is a player that fits that description because I like his fit with Victor and he has a ton of upside. He's a tall combo guard that's a good playmaker and scorer, needs to improve his shot consistency but you guys know how I feel about suiting and I always feel that the only major red flag I have 
with prospects as suitors, especially as guards and wings, is the confidence. If they lack confidence, that's a major red flag. Anything else I feel like can be worked on with proper development. Castle has a ton of talent and role lineup versatility. And I think having him alongside Victor is a good foundation for the future if it would actually happen. But I also think Castle could make a case to go higher this upcoming year. And with a good year at UConn, on a team that projects to make a deep tournament run, if he's really good for them, he could be a top three pick. And I wouldn't be shocked if there's a world where he is the number one overall pick. But as of right now, I really like his fit with Victor, and he's on the board in this mock draft at pick six. Alexander has already put on an absolute show in his two preseason games against Ignite. He's a tall, versatile 45. He has fluid movement skills. He's really athletic. He can play inside and out on both ends of the four. And like with Castle, I just love the fit next to Victor. Both of them have great upside on both ends of the four. And while the concept of two guys that have similar skill sets not working together in terms of fit, is true in some cases i think when the similar skill set is based around versatility it's the opposite because i think it means it's a great fit now similar to castle sar is a player that could go even higher and might contend for that top pick in the draft depending on the type of year he has in the nbl the magic are in a similar spot to the pistons where targeting more versatile players is key and to kobe walter has proven in his young career that he is that up to this point he's a versatile defender he's a solid passer he's a solid scorer He's not great at one specific thing on offense, but I think he has a well-rounded skill set. And the Magic are a team that could use a guy like that, whether he ends up being a starter or coming off the bench. And the Magic are a team to look out for in a few years. I think they could be a playoff team this season and may end up being a team that's not even picking this high. But as of right now in this mock draft, based off the order that Tankathon has, they are, and they have that eighth pick. And I think Walter would be a great pick for them. Justin Edwards is a player that I'm not quite as high on as others are. I know a lot of people have him as this top 3-5 to five prospect. I'm not quite there with him. I don't see that top 3-5 to five type of prospect as of right now. He could prove me wrong in Kentucky. That's definitely a possibility. But I do think he's worth a top 10 pick. I like his skill set as a scorer and potential as a defender. The Jazz are in a situation where they could use a wing like him and also somewhat of a best player available guy. He's not my number 9 ranked prospect per se, but he has similar grades to the guys that I would consider with this pack and I do like the fit. They have Larry Markkinen, who has proven he can be an all-star to borderline all-NBA guy. They have Walker Kessler, who is one of the best young soft walkers in recent memory. I love the class they just brought in 2023 in Keontae George, Taylor Hendricks, and Bryce Sensaba. I think long-term Edwards has potential to be a good scorer in the NBA and a starting caliber wing in the NBA, a high-level one, in fact which is always something that teams could need and especially considering the fact that I look at that Jazz roster and I know they have Sensaba on the wing but outside of that a lot of the two three guys are guys that I don't know if they line up with the current timeline. The Rockets take another Ignite player at pick 10 in Izan Almanza. I love the motor, athleticism, and versatility with him. I think he fits the mold of what Ime Yudoka wants in a player. I think that you just take BP at this point if Houston gets a top 10 pick from the Nets and they're also picking higher with their own pick. And regardless, I think you are looking more for a high-end rotation guy with high-level starting upside, which Almanza has. Like with a few other picks so far, Almanza does have potential to rise up the boards, especially if he really plays well in that Ignite team, because people are going to be paying attention a lot to this Ignite team 
because of the fact they have so many NBA prospects this year in particular. And I do think that there is a chance he ends up the best of the Ignite guys between himself, Bruzelas, and Holland. And I really do think it would be a good pick for Houston. He could be a high-level rotation guy for them and maybe even a starter. I love what the Indiana Pacers are building. Halliburton is a legit offensive engine you can build around. Bandic Matherin is a really fun scorer with a ton of impressive upside. They got Jairus Walker in the most recent draft, who is a versatile monster that is more versatile and flexible. And I think they stay in state and take Hoosier wing Mackenzie Baco. Now, he's not from Indiana, but he will be playing for Indiana this season. And Baco is a big, physical wing that has good athleticism. But what stands out the most with him is his ability to suit the basketball. He has an argument for being the best suitor in the class, in my opinion, which is really interesting because you don't really see guys as physically developed as him be the level of suitor that he is. He fits with this Pacers team. I think you slide him right into that three spot and you have a lineup of Halliburton, Matherin, and Baco. Walker and Miles Turner who they just extended and finally decided they're going to keep after years of trade rumors. It's just a pick that makes a ton of sense for me as of right now. I know Mbako is a somewhat polarizing prospect. I know people have him late first round. I know guys that have him really high. I have him in that late lottery range and I do think that he is worthy of going 11th overall as of right now. The Pelicans are a team I just don't know how to feel about. When healthy, they are a legit threat in the West. In terms of talent on paper, when you look at that roster, they are one of the three to five best teams in the West on paper. The problem is, their generational talent that's a franchise centerpiece and one of the most gifted and talented young players in recent memory and puts up historic numbers hasn't proven he can stay healthy and the second star in a team who's really good hasn't proven to stay healthy either. I have him taking El Marco Jackson because I like him a lot with this pick obviously he wouldn't be going here if I didn't like him to the Pelicans because I look at that team and they could use a point guard. I like CJ McCollum a lot. McCollum is a guy that has an argument to be the best player that's never made an all-star team in his NBA career. I like the upside of Dyson Daniels as a connector on the wing that can maybe play some guard. But I don't think either of them are natural point guards. And El Marco Jackson is a player that I think is a legit point guard. He can attack the basket. He's a good passer. I think getting a legit point guard would be good for them. The Timberwolves have a potential superstar in Anthony Edwards. You guys know how high I am on him. I've made a ton of videos on him on the channel at this point. But they have question marks outside of him in terms of the other big contracts on the team. Cat is super talented. In terms of pure talent, he's one of the most gifted offensive bigs we have ever seen. And I don't think that's a hot take. The problem is he has durability questions. He hasn't really been able to stay healthy since his second or third season. And he's unreliable in the playoffs. He's a legit liability in the playoffs. The numbers show it. The tape shows it. And then you look at Gobert, who is really good. He's going to be a Hall of Famer, even if I don't want to admit it. But he's not getting any younger. So I think getting a piece that fits with Anthony Edwards is important. They have Jaden McDaniels. I like him a lot. So I look at the team and say, Mike Conley is good. Mike Conley is one of the most underrated players of his generation. But he's not getting any younger. So I had him taking Elliot Cadeau, who in my opinion is the second best playmaker in the class behind Collier. He's unselfish, he's high feel, he plays well with others, he's really good in terms of manipulation, one of the more fun watches going into the cycle. Now he's a bit small, so he will have to prove himself as a suitor the way other small guards have, but I think he has a legit starting point guard upside and 
could be a great long-term replacement for Mike Connolly. The Knicks get this pick from the Mavericks via the Big Bird trade, and I have them taking the best player on the board, in my opinion, and Donovan Klingon from UConn. Klingon is a top 10 prospect in my opinion, but due to fit, he does fall to pick 14 here. Now, the Knicks have Mitchell Robinson, but I don't think he's a long-term answer. He was really good in that Cleveland Cavaliers series and then not so good in the Miami Heat series. He is a really good shot blocker and really good athlete, but there are questions about his versatility. There are questions about the consistency, and it really has felt like he's been on the trade block or in trade rumors with New York for a while now, at least according to him. And Klingon can do what Robinson does well in terms of play finishing and shot blocking. He's not quite the athlete Robinson is, but he moves well for his size. He's 7'2", 265, and just is able to run the floor and has decent lateral movement. But in my opinion, he's a higher field prospect than Robinson was at the same stage. Monster Saw Parker, a massive human being, good at drawing contact, has some passing upside, maybe not this big time suitor or this guy that can run you offense and be a 25 point per game, 10 rebound per game guy. I don't think he's that, but I know what he's good at. What he's good at is valuable and worth taking in the lottery. Now, moving forward with the non-lottery picks, it's going to go a lot quicker. I'm not going to go into nearly as much detail with each pick. This video is already really long, and I don't want to go into this much detail on every pick, because if I did, my laptop will be fighting for its life. Also, if you're still watching up to this point and haven't already, we'd really appreciate if you would like and subscribe. Anyways, let's finish up this mock draft. The Bulls take Tyrese Proctor from Duke at pick 15. A combo go with good upside as a connector. The Hawks take Valley Krugel from Florida at pick 16. A good combo go that can provide depth alongside Kobe Bufkin and AJ Griffin off the bench. The Knicks take Zachary Rousseau at pick 17. A versatile wing with really good upside that has gotten top 3 buzz, although I don't quite see that. The Thunder take Kalel Ware at pick 18, a versatile big who had some top 10 buzz going into 2023, but ended up transferring to Indiana after an underwhelming year at Oregon. Like his fit as a big in terms of depth or next to Chet if they move Chet to the four. The Pacers take AJ Johnson at pick 19, a fun scoring wing that has been mentored by Jalen Green and it's obvious when you watch him play. Needs to bulk up and be more consistent, but with a good year in the NBL, or at least a year where he shows potential, he could be a lottery guy or even get top 10 buzz. The Cavs take Bronny James at pick 20. Assuming he's medically cleared and plays as well as I think he can, he will be a first rounder on his own merits, not just because of his name. He has role flexibility, he's a good connector. Good defender, high field player, unselfish, plays well with others, and a fun storyline at this pick for obvious reasons. The Atlanta Hawks take Cody Williams at pick 21. The younger brother of Thunder 2023 lottery pick Jalen Williams has a legit potential as a connector and even some on ball upside on the wing, but needs to bulk up and is a bit raw and needs to put it all together. The Heat take Guerrero Dual at pick 22. He's a good defender, has a good handle, good passer, good slasher, and just fits what the Heat are culture-wise. The Celtics take Judah Mins at pick 23, a guy who I thought had late first round, early second round potential in 2023, but decided to come back for his sophomore year. Really good defender, solid scorer, and a good passer, but needs to improve his three-point consistency. The 76ers take Kyle Filipowski at pick 24, a skilled big, good rebounder, solid passer, not the most consistent three-point shooter, and also not a great men protector, which is why he's going here and not in the top 10. The Pelicans take Melvin Ajinka at pick 25, he's an athletic wing with creation, upside, and two-way potential, could go higher depending on the year he has this upcoming cycle. 
the Grizzlies take Adam Bona at pick 26, an athletic big with rim protection upside, great energy, and super wide depth at the big man spot that was clearly lacking in that series against the Lakers. The Celtics take Jared McCain at pick 27, known more for his TikToks, but he's really good as a basketball player as well, can play on and off the ball, good motor, and can play both ends of the floor. The Suns take Aaron Bradshaw at pick 28, a rim protector that can play finish and somewhat suit the basketball. I know there's some lottery buzz around him, but I have some questions about his movement skills. But regardless, I do think as of right now, he is a first round prospect, could be good depth for the Suns as a big and maybe a long term starter with the uncertainty of Aiton's future with the team. The Bucks take Omaha Bellew at pick 29, a bold versatile forward with high defensive upside. And the Nuggets take Bobby Quintman at pick 30, a big wing with perimeter and defensive upside that had some first round buzz last cycle but looks to capitalize and solidify his first round status this upcoming year. Here is a full recap of 2024 NBA Mock Draft 1.0. The Wizards used the first overall pick on the physical primary playmaker from USC, Isaiah Collier. The Rockets at pick 2 take the high-flying, high-energy, versatile wing-forward hybrid from Ignite and Ron Holland. At pick 3, the Blazers take the gifted playmaking big, Ade Mara. At pick 4, the Pistons take the high upside versatile wing from Ignite and Matas Bruzelis. Pick 5, the Hornets get a backcourt mate for LaMelo Ball long term and combo guard DJ Wagner from Kentucky. At pick 6, the Spurs take Stefan Castle, a combo guard that should fit really well next to Victor Wimbanyama. And at pick 7, the Spurs up again via Toronto, take Alexander Saar, the versatile 4-5 hybrid that should also fit well next to Wembenyama. Pick 8, the Magic take to Kobe Walter, the versatile Swiss Army Knife wing from Baylor. Pick 9, the Jazz take the talented scoring wing from Kentucky, Justin Edwards. Pick 10, the Rockets via Brooklyn because of the Harden trade. Grab another Ignite player. This time they get the versatile 4 5 hybrid in Izan Almansa. At pick 11, the Pacers take somebody that will be playing in state this upcoming season in four spacing wing with great physicality, Mackenzie and Baco. At pick 12, the Pelicans get a point guard from Kansas and El Marco Jackson. At pick 13, the Timberwolves get a point guard that should fit well next to Anthony Edwards and Elliot Cadeau from UNC. At pick 14, via Dallas, the New York Knicks get Donovan Klingon, one of the best, if not the best, rim protector in the class from UConn. At pick 15, the Chicago Bulls get the talented connecting guard from Duke, Tyrus Proctor. At pick 16, the Hawks get more backward depth with Valley Kugel. At pick 17, the Knicks take a swing on the high upside friends wing in Zachary Vassar. At pick 18, the Thunder add more front court depth with Kalel Ware, the versatile big at Indiana. Pick 19, the Pacers take a swing with their pick they got from the Lakers with AJ Johnson, a talented scoring wing that's going to be playing in the NBL. At pick 20, the Cavs grab one of the best connecting guards and one of the best defensive guards in Bronny James, and that's a fun storyline, again, for obvious reasons. The Hawks are back up at pick 21 via Sacramento, and they take Cody Williams, a really high potential wing that has some connections with a brother in the NBA. Pick 22, the Miami Heat take Goro Duall, one of the better guard defenders who fits the culture. Pick 23, the Boston Celtics take Judah Menz, a talented combo guard. Pick 24, the 76ers take a versatile big from Duke and Kyle Filipowski. Pick 25, the Pelicans, via the Lakers in the Anthony Davis trade, get Melvin Ajinka, a high upside wing. Pick 26, the Grizzlies add more front court depth with UCLA big man Adem Bona. Pick 27, Celtics add more guard depth. Again, with Jared McCain, the combo guard from Duke. Pick 28, 
The Suns add front crew depth with Aaron Bradshaw, the big man from Kentucky, pick 29. The Bucks get a relatively high forward but high ceiling player in Omaha Bellew, a versatile forward from Ohio State. And the Nuggets get Bobby Clintman, the versatile wing that will be playing in the NBL. But that's the end of this video. If you made it to this point, thank you so much. Again, haven't already? Like, subscribe, hit notification bell, notified whenever I release a video. I make videos about basketball all the time, so liking and subscribing are the two best ways you can help me out in the YouTube algorithm and help me reach my goal of 10,000 subscribers by the end of the 2024 NBA season. Let's try and get 100 likes on this video so YouTube will recommend it to others. Let me know what you think about this mock draft. Who do you think I had going too high? Who do you think I had going too low? Who do you think will get the number one pick? What do you think the order is going to be? Let me do all that in the comment section below. But with that being said, have a nice day and I'll see you guys in the next one.